So now we're back to the book of Nahum. In fact, today we conclude our series of messages on the book of Nahum. Next week, we'll begin a new one on the prophet Zephaniah. But today, we're back to Nahum. So if you have your Bibles with you, I wanted to read together Nahum chapter 3. Nahum chapter 3, we'll be reading together verses 12 through 19. Nahum chapter 3, verses 12 through 19. Now, there is a Bible there called the New International Version of the Bible in your pews because I wanted us to hold that Bible and we'll read together the NIV. If you don't have an NIV, that's fine. But there's an NIV in front of you in the pew. So try to grab that and we're going to read Nahum chapter 3, verses 12 through 19. So shall we rise in honor of the Word of God. Nahum chapter 3, beginning with verse 12. Together, all your fortresses are like fig trees with their first ripe fruit. When they are shaken, the figs fall into the mouth of the eater. Look at your troops. They are all women. The gates of your land are wide open to your enemies. Fire has consumed their bars. Draw water for the siege. Strengthen your defenses. Work the clay. Tread the mortar. Repair the brickwork. There the fire will devour you. The sword will cut you down. And like grasshoppers, consume you. Multiply like grasshoppers. Multiply like locusts. You have increased the number of your merchants till they are more than the stars of the sky. But like locusts, they strip the land and then fly away. Your guards are like locusts, your officials like swarms of locusts that settle in the walls on a cold day. But when the sun appears, they fly away, and no one knows where. O king of Assyria, your shepherds slumber, your nobles lie down to rest. Your people are scattered on the mountains with no one to gather them. Nothing can heal your wound. Your injury is fatal. Everyone who hears the news about you claps his hands at your fall. For who has not felt your endless cruelty? This is the word of the Lord. He will add his blessings to its reading. Shall we all sit down? You will recall that Nahum was actually preaching to the Ninevites to this world power of the day known as Assyria. And Nineveh, of course, was the capital city of Nineveh. And as he was preaching the word of God to the Ninevites, of course, there's the southern kingdom of Judah, remember. Now, the northern kingdom of Israel was no more. Because in 722 BC, Israel was already taken captive by this world power known as Assyria. But the southern kingdom was still alive and kicking. They were a vassal state, basically, but they were never conquered yet. And so it is like reading Nahum, and you wonder whether this big, powerful enemy known as Assyria would one day, one day dominate and conquer the southern kingdom as well. Will they? And therefore, as a southern kingdom person, as you hear Nahum preaching to the Ninevites, that message, because it's against the Ninevites, it's judgment, it's doom. As a Judahite, as a Judean, you're probably saying, good for you. I'm safe because God is on our side. Would God actually allow the Ninevites to conquer them? That is the questions they're probably thinking when they hear Nahum preaching. And so today we conclude his message to the Ninevites while Judah is listening in. You know, perhaps one of the saddest, most painful words, words that we probably don't want to hear when we visit the hospital and see our doctor, are these words, it's terminal. Nobody wants to hear those words. And sometimes it's not necessarily directed straight to the patient. It's given to the loved ones, right? It's terminal. The sickness is terminal. In other words, health has finally yielded. Hope 
has been exhausted. God's patience has run out. And there's only the dying seconds towards perdition. And so what we see here is that God is already saying, Ninevites, it's terminal. In other words, there's no longer any room for repentance. All the possibilities, all the opportunities have been given to you. And God is saying, I'm sorry. It's over. The soul has been so hardened to the point of incorrigibility. When the last of all motivations has been used up, like fear and judgment, I mean, sometimes we use those, right, to motivate a response. We fear people into heaven. We scare them into heaven. And fear and judgment, the last of all motivations, right? And the spirit remains brick hard. Then we know that the destiny of hell has been fixed on the GPS of life and no one can change that destination nor reverse that destination even though we may take a detour that GPS is going to reroute and it's still going to take you to perdition see God is the one who said it in the first place and he will not contradict himself vengeance is underway and so the question for us is this when vengeance gets rolling the ensuing drama what does that look like when God's vengeance is actually unveiling if it's rolling what's it gonna look like for us and for his enemies well there's four things I wanted to share with you when God's vengeance begins the first is simply this defeat is gonna be easy no sweat. Look at verse 12. All your fortifications are fig trees with ripe fruit. When shaken, they fall into the eater's mouth. Now, ripe fruit is literally the first ripe fruit. Strictly speaking, it's the first fruit and it's the earliest yield of the tree, regardless of its species. It's the first fruit. It's the first of the yield. It's the first of the season. And we understand that late figs actually are picked up. They ripen in August and September. But the first fruits of the fig tree will come ready to be picked at the end of May and in June. So it's in May and June that people actually see this first fruit. Now it's a well-known fact that fruit that matures quickly, ripens early in the season, they drop more easily than the latter fruit. I just noticed that in our lemon tree back in our place when he first came he said wow look at all those fruits wow it's so nice to see those yellow lemons and the next day they're all dropping they're all on the floor I said what happened well they're the first ones but now we still have lemons and they don't drop anymore because they're the late ones you see the ripe fruit the first fruit they're easy to pluck in fact sometimes you just shake the thing and it drops off so what do we see what we see here is this, in the same easy way, the final assault on Nineveh, Assyria, the invaders will not be forced to wage a long, protracted campaign at the cost of much blood, cost of much labor. Defeat will be so easy that it's like you're watching the Cleveland Cavaliers play against the Miami Heat in 1991. Some of you weren't born yet. But in 91, do you know how... The Cavs devastated the Heat. The Cavaliers won by 68 points. Can you imagine that? 68 points? That's right. I mean, those were the times when LeBron didn't exist yet. He wasn't even Cleveland yet. He wasn't even Miami yet. But the Cavs beat them by 68 points. I mean, the best players could just relax on the bench, not even play, because it's so easy. The defeat is so predictable. No sweat. But not only that, it's really no match. Why? Here's a sarcasm, right? Sarcastically, Nahum is saying, Behold, your people are women in your midst. Not that women are less equal than men. But it's easy because, as Nahum is suggesting, 
your defenders are women. They're not men. Well, they are actually men, but they're like women in the sense that back in those days, women were peace-loving. Women were not as violent as men. In fact, women shun violence at every instance. And therefore, what Nahum is saying, well, your soldiers who should be the bravest and the ones ready to spill blood, well, they're like women who are so peaceable. Women. You know, one commentator even suggested that King Ashurbanipal, you know, the king of Assyria, could have had effeminate tendencies. Why? Because there was this portrait that survived the times of King Ashurbanipal. And when you see the king, you know what his face looks like? Porcelain smooth. I mean, it, 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 it's not like the face of men today where, never mind. But it's like a, a woman's face where it's really taken care of. It's so smooth and silky. And when you look at his eyes, it's all made up with blush on, no, not blush on, but mascara and all that, because it's black. And it's also nice. And not only that, he actually wore woman's clothes. And so one commentator is actually suggesting that just as your king is like that, your troops are the same. Your people, your soldiers are the same. It's no match. Not only no sweat, no match, and not only that, he continues on verse 13. The gates of your land are opened wide to your enemies. Fire consumes your gate bars. In other words, there's no one standing. You see, no sweat, no match, no stand. And so after the metaphor, the reality, not only are the gates of the forts opened wide, not only are the gates and the ports of entry into Assyria opened wide, it actually says fire consumes your gate. And so what do we see here? It's like entering LAX from an airplane from overseas, and you come into the terminal, and you're in uh, the international terminal, and you find out, my goodness, there is no line, no queues on the immigration counters. I mean, you just walk in. There are no immigration officers, and you just walk in. Isn't that great? And you go down to San Diego over there, and you recognize, wait a minute, there is no wall. Oh, no, wait a minute, look at the port of entry. Look at all those gates. There's no one there. And everybody's just coming in and out. They're all open. The gates are open from the mountainous north to all the flatlands around Assyria each and every border control had their officers gone A-W-O-L absent without leave but that's not the only thing we hear here the bar that holds the gate door strong and sturdy is on fire now you understand back in those days fortresses had huge wooden gates right even during medieval times, you know, they had gates for their castles. It's the same thing. Fortresses had wooden gates. Now, here's a question for you. Why would Nahum actually single out the bar of the gate? Not simply say the gates are burning with fire, but he's actually saying the bar is burning. Did you see that? Now, what is a bar? The bar is like the padlock today, right? You lock your gates. You lock your door with a padlock. So back in those days, they had no padlocks. They used a bar. Now, here's a, here's a situation where we actually have found an Assyrian gate. This you will find in the British Museum in London. It's an actual Assyrian gate. Now, you'll notice there's not really a bar, but you see all these metal strips, horizontal strips, right, throughout the gate, from bottom up to the top. You see the metal strips. Those are like the bars, but what are they? Here's what they look like. Something is, is hammered into it like a picture, right? And you see horses, you saw chariots, you see a procession of people, you see victories, you see plunder, you see all kinds of people, you see the king, etc., etc. So what are they? Well, here's another one of them which looks more real, right? And so you see there are marchers, archers, you see plunders, and you'll see the king on a chariot. And so all these things are mounted on the door. And they are like the bars of the door. So what are they? They're 
Today, they will be our trophies. If you win, you have a victory, you're successful. They are our plaques of appreciation. They are our trophies of victory. And so when Nahum says not only are the gates open or the gates burning, it's these bars, golden bars, metallic bars that are actually melting. Your successes, what makes you the proud kind of nation that you are, what makes you the powerful force that you are, put together with your pride, all these things are burning. The whole impression, of course, when you take the tour of what Nahum is saying is that Assyria is so domestic. It's so open. But when you say that to an Assyrian and an Ninevite, that, you know, you're, you're so domestic. You know what that means? It sounds like, wait a minute, macho this guy. You don't say I'm domestic. What do you mean? So for an Assyrian, we say, you're so domestic and open, like it's really tame. That's an irony. Because to those under Assyrian oppression, we all know what an offense to the Ninevites who consider themselves war-worthy. They consider themselves fit and they are prepared to the death. Here we all see defeat comes easy when God's vengeance is on a roll. Second thing we learn, defense is useless. You see, they're called to fight. Again, more sarcasm. Nahum says, draw for yourself water for the siege, verse 14. Strengthen your fortifications. Go into the clay, tread the mortar, take hold of the brick mold. Right? What's he saying? Urgent action. It's emergency. Strengthen everything. You know, in other words, prepare for war. And make sure you have the strength you need and you are certainly prepared. In other words, look for the best mason in town. Look for the best carpenters because we need to strengthen our walls. Get ready for war. Sarcastic. Because in reality, all that effort will prove useless. Useless at all. The best masonry work possible in the urgency of time doesn't matter. Why? Because the sword will cut you down. It's not only the fire, but the sword. You see, back in those days, it's always fire and sword. Not only did they burn cities, burn towns, they killed the inhabitants. When fire and sword are put together in the Old Testament, you know what? It's always a big catastrophe. All the time. It's never a small thing. It's a big time catastrophic event. So the picture is like this. Urgent action, Nahum says. In other words, the river around the city, they're about to overflow and the rain doesn't stop. And therefore everyone, before you evacuate, do something. Strengthen the walls around the river. In other words, get sandbags ready. Put them all together and pile them up with each other as high as we can so that when that river overflows, it's not going to overflow toward us. But guess what? Even with all that strength, with all that expert knowledge about sandbagging, all that urgent action doesn't really matter. Fire will consume. Sword will kill. Assyrian metropolis, Nineveh. Not only will it be captured, consigned to the flame, it will be completely destroyed, its inhabitants killed. That's why really the only real response is a compulsion to flee the scene. And so look at what Nahum continues to say. Verse 16. You have increased your traders more than the stars of heaven. The creeping locust strips and flies away. Your guardsmen are like the swarming locust. Your marshals are like hordes of grasshoppers settling in the stone walls on a cold day. The sun rises and they flee and their whereabouts is not known. Now, what's Nahum trying to communicate here? You see, it's a very well-known fact that Assyria has grown to be such a powerhouse 
They've reached as far as Cappadocia in Turkey or Asia Minor back in those days, the empire. They've reached as far as the Caspian Sea to the north of Assyria. They've gone as far east to what we know today as Iran. All of that were under the power of the time that is Assyria. And here we find three kinds of people. They're known as traders, guardsmen, and marshals. At least in the New American Standard Bible, that's what it says. They're traders, business people, they're guardsmen, soldiers, and they're marshals. And marshals are probably the, the scribes and the lawyers of the day. So what's going on? Nahum is saying, you know, your business people, your economic drivers of the day, you know, they're like fleeting grasshoppers. Now, when you look at a grasshopper or a locust, if you look at it just one, say, oh, this thing is cute. You know, sometimes you can catch them. But you multiply those, and they become swarms. Nakakatakyut. No, I mean, it, it's a fearsome thing to see swarms of locusts and grasshoppers because the amount of devastation those little things can do together is just massive. I mean, they can raise a whole agricultural land in hours and everything is gone simply by flying through them, these swarms, and everything is gone. Not that they're gone physically, but all the fruit harvest is gone. And so it says your traders are like these locusts. In other words, when you come, it's like as if we're going to have trade and commerce with each other but actually when you come guess what your soldiers are with you now let's have trade together oh no 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 we're not into fair trade we just trade according to what we want you don't like what I'm selling you and how much we're selling it to you for or exchanging it to you for well you talk to our guard here our soldier he'll take care of you here, here it is it's all yours no need for an exchange it's yours and then the lawyers come, the writers of the rules of the day, the marshals they're called. And they're the ones responsible to redistribute the wealth, redistribute the land. And so the businessmen, the traders gather wealth, they export it back to Nineveh's markets. The soldiers come for riding military escort so that they're able to do, accomplish what they should. But here's what Nahum is saying. You have economic drivers with you. There are swarms and legions of them. You have a judiciary system of what looks like a series of laws and how things are governed. And you have the military regime. And they're all in cahoots with each other because they're so corrupt and they cause trouble. Everyone knows one another. They're related to somebody else in this enterprise, so corrupt enterprise. And that's the systemic evil in the culture. And Nahum is saying, with all that bureaucracy, you know what I'm saying? With all that bureaucracy upon which Assyria depended, doesn't provide the expected support that it needs. Instead, she leads in the panic flight from the invader's onslaught. You know, there is this bas relief of Ashurbanipal. They found this. This is real. It's a bas relief, and you'll see it's actually etched in clay or stone. And what you find here is Ashurbanipal reclining. You see him on the rightmost side? Over there. He's reclining. And there are grapes just about to fall to his mouth. Right? Just about to fall. All he needs to do is to shake it a little bit, and it's into his mouth. Seems to be Nahum is saying, yeah, that's the fig tree. He probably saw this thing saying, you know what? That's the fig tree. And actually, you're not the king. You're the fruit. You are about to fall. And it's not only that. You see the queen. She's seated on an imposing throne. And then you have attendants with huge fans. And they keep the circulation of air flowing. But at the same time, they're shooing away flies and locusts and all kinds of insects. And so here's a... Here's a portrait of the time, and perhaps Nahum was actually looking at that thing where everybody prided about, see all your attendants? See all what they're doing? They're shooing away all these 
terrible insects and they are making it cool on us and the king is eating of the fruit and there's the queen and they're having a good time well guess what it's all the opposite those locusts are coming grasshoppers are coming fact, you were that grasshopper before but there are more grasshoppers coming and they're gonna consume you you're that fruit that's gonna be eaten so what happens the third thing when vengeance is coming drive is missing now I have to say this because I think it's important because some of us might be nursing an attitude that you know I, I'm young and I can take God seriously tomorrow you know I'm young and I'm, I'm entitled to enjoy my life the way I want it you know I'm or you might be old and you're still thinking this way and you're thinking you know what I, I can I can delay being serious about my relationship with God but let me say this each time you delay each time you say there is a tomorrow I'm gonna to do that tomorrow I'll take God here some more every time you do that you add another layer of callousness to your spirit to your heart to your soul each and every time and then the time will come when you actually say well it's time to take God seriously that callous is so thick that you have no drive whatsoever you have no desire whatsoever for God and that's what happens you see Jonah preached and they repented hundred years ago now same people same nation different prophet there's no more tomorrow and even though there was someone who said oh I'm gonna repent you can't repent because you don't want it anymore spirit is dead what's happening here they're sleeping on the job your shepherds are sleeping O king of Assyria your nobles are lying down you see there's no sense of emergency there's no desire whatsoever for any action the call for urgent action is greeted with CPAP snores is that what you call it? that that thing you you put on so that you don't snore whatever that is that's what it is it's all snores now any king is powerless without his generals and rulers together with their loyal and royal strike force but here the strike force they're all drunk filled with much apathy and indifference sleeping I remember a story of a uh, a person who was hired to be the security guard of this rich uh, Christian employer and a security guard you know it's not easy to be a security guard especially if you're a guard at night you know the graveyard shift where nothing really happens or if there's gonna be some happening it's gonna be really really bad but on this night you know there was just nothing nothing was moving everything was so quiet and so there he was trying to look trying to be vigilant and finally he dozed off he fell asleep so he was seated his head was bowed like this so eyes are closed because now he was fast asleep and then his boss this Christian boss came checking seeing whether his people are actually working and so the Christian boss comes and as soon as he comes closer and closer this guy who's fast asleep begins to hear sounds of footsteps and then he opens his eyes a little bit and still looking down he says I know that shoes oh my that's my boss's feet and I am asleep and so he simply says in Jesus name Amen <laughs> oh boss how are you you know he must be a Filipino security guard over there <laughs> sleeping on the job that's what they were there's just no desire no drive whatsoever sleeping now there's more to this right there's more to this splintered all across your people are scattered on the mountains again people same word in verse 13 your troops 
your troops are scattered on the mountains. And that phrase can actually mean your troops are trying to catch their own breath. And so in that case, they've been running. They've been running in all directions like a pack of cats running away. It was impossible to herd them back together. Totally impossible. You know what they do? They call in sick for that day. But only to be found on Facebook enjoying a holiday in the mountain resorts. You know what I'm saying? Sir, uh, I don't feel well today. But over lunchtime, you see a post on Facebook. Say, What's he doing over there? <laughs> They're scattered on the mountains. In reality, they're scurrying up the mountains because that's their real hideouts. They are supervisorless, it says, shepherdless. There is no one to regather them, the Bible says. It was impossible to herd them. There was also nobody found to get the job done. And so the king's generals went missing in action. They're probably the first to evacuate, just like the captain of the ferry in South Korea that capsized some three years ago. You remember? Sewol Ferry Disaster in South Korea where there were more than 400 passengers and most of them were teenagers because they were having a field trip to this resort island, Cheju. And it sunk. And you know why it sunk? I don't know why it sunk. But you know who's the first to abandon ship? The captain. That captain, of course, is in jail now. The first to abandon ship it's like, the, it's like the generals. When the going got tough, they were the first ones to abandon and they were lost. Well, why not? They're the ones who have the helicopters. They're the ones who have the means in order to get lost really quickly. Right? And so what do we see? There was no one to command the panic-stricken people. Reminds me of Jesus' compassion when he saw the people from the Mount of Olives, looking down to Jerusalem, who were like sheep without a shepherd, compassion. But you know what Jesus, if Jesus were here, he would look at the people, having no shepherd, running all over the place. You know what? He's going to clap his hands. Because it's vengeance time. Repentance time is no longer available. There is no longer any opportunity for repentance. It's all vengeance. And therefore, Jesus, if he were here, of course he's not. He hasn't been born yet. <laughs> Finally, here it comes. Nineveh wiped out forever. A complete end of that nation has come. Day of rebuilding, day of restitution, never to dawn. And so this vast, corrupt, violent, arrogant, imperial machine of Assyria, which looked so infinitely powerful as a locust swarm, it simply disappears overnight. And so the final word to them is this, when God's vengeance is on a roll, disease is terminal. There is no relief for your breakdown, the Bible says. Your wound is incurable. That word breakdown, of course, is breach. In other words, the breach in your walls can never be restored. That injury that you have can never be healed. It has atrophied. It's gangrenous. It can never be saved. By the English Standard Version says, there is no easing your hurt. And the message put it this way, you're past the point of no return. Your wound is fatal. It's malignant. It's terminal. You want to say, Tsaka na lang? Even those words you won't be able to utter. And therefore, all who hear about you will clap their hands over you. For on whom has not your evil passed continually? Hopelessness to one people, happiness to another people. See, there remains nothing more except to pronounce a brief funeral lament over the Assyrian king whose generals sleep the sleep of death, whose troops are scattered, and whose doom, doom is greeted with delight greeted with derision by all because everybody rejoices to be free 
from this evil regime. And so when you read Psalm 47, the first two verses, it goes like this. Oh, clap your hands, all people. Shout to God with a voice of joy. For the Lord Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdues peoples under us and nations under our feet. In other words, those words affirm the sovereignty, the power, the authority of God to overthrow each and everyone who will attempt to oppose him. Whatever nation that is who opposes God, whatever person he or she may be who opposes God, overthrow when vengeance comes. There's this famous Irish cleric and politician. <laughs> you remember? Pastor, politician, wow, unheard of. His name is Dr. Ian Paisley. You may have heard of his name. But he was reported to have been preaching one Sunday on the Day of Judgment. And as he reached the climax of his sermon, he said that on the Day of Judgment, there would be wailing and gnashing of teeth. At which point, of course, an old woman held her hand and, and said, Doc, Dr. Paisley, Dr. Paisley, I have no teeth. And Paisley replied, Madam, teeth will be provided on the day of judgment. It will be provided. So the question for us is this. Since there's no doubt that God avenges, since there's no doubt that God is a God of justice, since there's no doubt that God will not let evil go unnoticed, what do we do? If God is an avenger, what do we do? There's two things we need to take heed of. The first is a word of comfort. It's a word of comfort for those who are on the side of righteousness. For those who have put their trust in God and whose lives revolve around God this is a word of comfort for his children is a word of comfort because God's justice is like a coin with two sides one side is vindication he vindicates the righteous he affirms righteousness he knows who the innocent are and so there's vindication on the one side of his justice. But on the other side of his justice, there's vengeance. It's vindication and vengeance. And vengeance simply says, I'm going to punish the guilty. Evil will be taken care of. And so that's what we have here. If we're on the side of righteousness, there will be vindication. In fact, if we're on the side of righteousness because we have faith in God through Jesus Christ, you can defend. You can and you are empowered to defend your innocence if ever you are maligned. If ever somebody accuses you, you are empowered to defend yourself. That's the side of justice. You are innocent. You can defend yourself. But when it comes to the other side, when it talks about vengeance, and it talks about the ones who have offended you, the Bible tells us we cannot and we are not empowered to take vengeance against those who wrong us. We just don't have the authority. We're not given the yes by God, the approval, to take matters into your hand in order to avenge yourself. It doesn't belong to you. It only belongs to God. That's why Paul the Apostle says in Romans 12, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy, he continues on, But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals 
of shame upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What do we learn? A word of comfort for us who are on the right side of things. Don't play the revenge game with anyone, right? With anyone. Because it doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to me. It only is the property of God himself. John Piper had this to say, God always punishes every wrong. He punishes the evil in hell for those who don't repent. Or he'll punish the evil on the cross of Christ for those who repent. To take vengeance yourself is to say, remember, to take vengeance yourself is to say, hell is not an, in, uh, not an adequate punishment. It is inadequate if you take revenge yourself. Or you're also saying, the cross is an inadequate sacrifice if you take revenge into your own hands. Now, the Bible says this. It's one thing not to take revenge. But you see, there's the other side here. He says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Thirsty, give him a drink. It doesn't say, don't take revenge, period. It doesn't say, once you've said sorry, once you've said you're forgiven, just stay there. I'll stay here. I don't care about you. Don't care about me. We're okay. The Bible doesn't say that. He says, feed him. Feed her. Don't feed her more junk. You say, see what he did? See what she did? See that? See that? See that? Don't do that. Because that is God's property. That is God's domain. And by doing that, we put ourselves in the place of God. It is not for us to do. We are to feed our enemy. And you know what? That's how we grow. That's how we love. That's how we care for one another. Once there was a doctor who informed his patient, and the doctor said, Yes, indeed. Sorry to say, but you have rabies. And upon hearing this, the patient immediately pulled out a pad and pencil and began to write. Uh, the doctor thought, what's he doing? Is he writing his last will and testament? And so the doctor said, listen, listen. You're not going to die. It doesn't mean you're going to die. There's a cure for rabies. And the patient said, oh, doctor, I know that. I'm just making a list of all the people I'm going to bite from now on. Many people live by that rule, unspoken. Don't get mad, get even. And God tells us, vengeance belongs to me, not you. It's also a word of caution. And what do we mean? You see, the book of Nahum ends with a question, right? And there is no other book in the Bible except another one that ends with a question. Do you know which book that is? Only two books in the Bible end with a question. Nahum is one. The other is Jonah. That's right. Jonah is the other one. And they both went to Nineveh and actually preached the message to Nineveh. But it's the same message, basically, judgment. But there's a different response. One responded and said, I repent of all my sins. Your God is right. Nahum preaches almost the same message, but they don't repent. There's no more room for repentance. God's vengeance is here. You see, here's the lesson. That's why it's a word of caution. Don't play games with God. Repent like the people in Jonah's day. Otherwise, the alternative is vengeance. You see, we're in a far better position, of course, than the people in Jonah's and Nahum's time because from this vantage point, we know about Jesus Christ. We understand that God judged Jesus on behalf of sinners so that all who repent and trust in Jesus Christ will escape the day of His vengeance. It's as simple as that. God loves each one of us, but He's also a God of justice. And therefore, in order to treat you and me the right way, love 
and justice is to still pour out his vengeance on sin, which he did in Jesus, so that the righteousness of Jesus might be ours. Dear friends, the question is, what are you trusting in? What are you depending upon when God judges you? In what are you placing your confidence? Is it the confidence of power, water, fortresses, power, money? Are you trusting in yourself? I'll take care of myself. I know where I'm going. I'm the captain of my soul. No such thing as God. No such thing as judgment. Fine. What are you trusting in is the question today. And to bring that to the core of our souls, let me give you an illustration of a game show called The Million Dollar Drop. And in this game show, I think it's classic of how we think concerning our trust. Put yourself in the position of a contestant. And at the outset of the game, you're given a million dollars. At the outset. Here's a million dollars. It's all yours. But you have to finish the game. So what you do is you try to preserve as much as possible the million dollars, right? But there's always a question that you need to respond to. Question and answer. And in every question, for every question, there's four possible answers. But only one right answer. The three are wrong. And so you see here, four different drop boxes. For answer one, two, three, and four. And what you do with a million dollars is you try to guess which is the right answer. And then you divide your million dollars accordingly. Because for the wrong answer, so three of these drop boxes, if it's a wrong one, it's going to open, it's going to suck all that money, it's gone. Make sense? Right. And so there's a question, that's a hard question. Hmm. I think I'll put half of it in box A, drop box A, because I think that's the right answer. But I'm not sure. Maybe we should put some in box B, or maybe a few more in C or D, at least we have something. Right? That's actually what we do in life when it comes to faith. And the question is simple. What are you trusting in? What are you putting your confidence in in life for your ultimate, eternal salvation? Is it the box of good works? I'm going to put a little bit there. Or maybe... I'm going to trust in my power. I'm going to trust in my possessions. I'm going to trust in what I have. I'm going to put some in there. Or maybe I'm going to trust in religion. I'm going to trust in what my parents say. Go to church. Do your thing. As long as you're in church, you're fine. Well, I'll trust religion. I'll put some in religion. But there's one box that says Jesus alone. And you say, you know, I've heard that message before. Jesus alone saves. So maybe that's the right answer. And therefore, I will put much of my trust in Jesus. But I'll also put some on good works, just to make sure. And you know, when you put some of those in other options, all those boxes drop the money and there's nothing left. Because the Bible says if you add more to Jesus, he doesn't work. It must be Jesus alone and Jesus fully. And so what's the message? Repent today. If you haven't made that decision in your life, to finally surrender it all, not tomorrow, and say, Lord, I'm going to take you seriously from now on. If you haven't made that decision, there might be no tomorrow. Or there could be a tomorrow, but your heart could be so hardened that you don't even entertain the thought of that question anymore. What is it to you? Let's pray. 
while our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I just want to give you that moment where maybe you hear the voice of God right now and you say, Lord, I've heard you. And I know I've been playing around with my life. And now I've heard you loud and clear. And here I am, I surrender it all to you. Giving my life fully to you. Never again to play games with you. If that's your prayer, I want to pray with you. Lead you into a prayer. Is there anyone here? Raise your hand. While eyes are closed, heads are bowed. I want to say, Lord, here I am. It's all yours. Is there anyone? Perhaps you're here this morning and you're not sure of your eternal destiny. You're not sure that if something happens today and your life is snatched, that you're actually going to be with Jesus. And you need salvation. And if today you're not sure, you can be sure. You can be certain. Because His Word is sure. He says, wherever the Son is, they have life. When you repent of your sin and trust in Jesus alone for your salvation, you have life eternal. And so if you're here this morning and you're not sure, you want to be sure, I want to lead you as well in prayer to trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Is there anyone here this morning? Would you raise your hand? Anyone? Final call. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that indeed that great exchange has happened in our lives. That because of your love for us, you sent Jesus to carry the weight of our sin, the punishment of our sin, the power of sin, so that my sin would be punished and his righteousness might be credited to my account. Thank you that it is not by works, otherwise cursed are we. Thank you it's not by religion. It's not even by tugging on the coattails of mom and dad or Lolo and Lola, grandfather, grandmother. But it's a personal choice. And so thank you. Thank you for salvation. Thank you that indeed we have comfort in this world because you will net, not let evil go unpunished. And so regardless of our circumstances in life, whether we're treated fairly or not, whether we're victims of injustice, we can look at the cross and glory that Jesus too was a victim of injustice. And yet he left everything to God for vengeance. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for the great assurance and gift of life eternal. In Jesus' name, amen.